Welcome to the Great Ships of the Seven Seas. I'm Eric Ball, and I invite you to join me now as we set sail on these magnificent ocean liners. We're going to relive the glory days of ocean liners of the past and meet some of the colorful characters who sailed on these historic vessels. We'll see how ocean travel impacted immigration, the economy, wartime, and leisure travel. I've sailed on over 30 cruises in the past 20 years and lectured on five different cruise lines, including to such places as Europe, the Mediterranean, South America, Australia, New Zealand, and I've even met a penguin or two in Antarctica. As a history major from the University of California at Berkeley with a passion for ocean travel, I invite you to join me now as we set sail on the great ships of the seven seas. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, and welcome to the Great Ships of the Seven Seas. I'm Eric Ball, and it's my pleasure to be your host as we set sail on some of the most magnificent ocean liners that ever graced the Seven Seas. Today, we'll see how ocean liners impacted things such as travel, immigration, the economy, wartime, and leisure activities. Well, in 1654, my ancestor, 10 generations back from me, James Ball, set sail from Bristol, England to Colonial Virginia. He sailed in the same manner that so many people would sail across the Atlantic Ocean, looking for a new life, a better life in the new world. But the key thing about sailing in those days was the limitations of sail. That is to say, in those days, sailors were dependent upon the wind. Well, by the 19th century, there were developments that brought about steam power. The development from wooden hulls to iron hulls and eventually to steel hulls. And one of the very first shipping lines was that developed by Sir Samuel Cunard. He developed along with the John Brown Yard in Glasgow, Scotland, a line that brought about the Cunard Line. And the idea was the British government wanted to have a service, a weekly service, going back between Great Britain and the United States. To do that, he would need four ships, so that he would always have a ship at each end, plus two traversing the Atlantic. In those days, the ships had a sail, just as the traditional clipper ships had had, but they also had, as you see here, a mast for the engines, and right here was a paddle wheel. Now, we often think of paddle wheels in the way that they have them on the Mississippi, where the paddle wheel is at the stern, driving the water from the stern. But the original ships that were used on the Atlantic had the paddle wheel midships, right in the middle, because that was near where the engines were. They were dreadfully noisy, and they were not always as efficient as we might have liked to have had. Notice, as we said, we still had the sails 
still had the traditional clipper style bow. So very much a sailing ship. And you had to have the sails because if you ran out of fuel or if you had a mechanical problem with the sails, you could still limp into harbor. So in many ways, these were almost like a hybrid the way automobiles are today where they run on both gas and battery powered. This is a picture of the Britannia, the first Cunard ship, arriving in Boston Harbor with a little bit of ice, as you can see, with the sails furrowed. And here we see the paddle wheel in the middle. But the best part about this type of a ship was we could go from a six-week voyage, which was traditionally what it took to sail across the Atlantic. We could go from six weeks down to only 12 days. So that was a huge difference in terms of how quickly people could come across the Atlantic. Well, one of the first people to sail aboard the Britannia was none other than Charles Dickens himself, who sailed in 1842. And this line drawing is a representation of the kind of cabin that he might have, shall we say, enjoyed at that time. Uh, he found the experience to be terrifying. He hated the noise of the, of the engines. Uh, and in fact, he found it so terrifying that when he returned from America back to England, he actually took the longer, slower, but far quieter sailing vessel to come back home. Well, the key thing about the transatlantic trade is what developed very quickly in the latter half of the 19th century was the introduction of the Parsons turbine engine, which allowed for more uh, speed, the introduction of propellers instead of the paddle wheels on the side, and also, more importantly, the introduction of twin propellers. Because the problem was when you had a single propeller, or what they call single screw, if the shaft broke, there you would be. And so, of course, you had to continue to have sails on those early ships. Or otherwise, if that, if that uh, shaft broke, you'd be stuck. So sails didn't disappear from ships until the development of the twin propellers, because that way you had a backup. In very much the same way, you wouldn't consider getting on a jet plane to go over water unless it had at least two engines. Same sort of principle. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the hulls changed from wood to iron to steel. And the other thing that was interesting was the number of stacks. Uh, typically, people perceived that the more stacks a ship had, the safer it was and the faster it was. Now, that wasn't always necessarily true, but that was the perception, especially for immigrants. And so along the way came the time for the development of what we call the Blue Ribbon. And the Blue Ribbon essentially was a concept. And the idea was it was the speed of a ship from Bishop's Rock off the coast of Cornwall in England to Ambrose Lighthouse off of the coast of the New York Harbor. That was the distance. And as you see, in 1862, the Scotia, which is another one of the Cunard ships, could make 15 knots. But by 1893, a ship could make it in about 21 knots per hour. And now, just to give you an idea, today's modern cruise ships typically sail somewhere between maybe 15, 18, 20, maybe 22 knots. Only a few ocean liners ever get much faster than that. So more than 100 years ago, the ships could go approximately as fast as we, as we sail today. Well, of course, one of the great benefits of having these massive ships were that they could facilitate immigration. Along about the same time, you have the, the dreadful uh, potato famine in Ireland, where people were literally starving to death. This helped to generate the interest in immigration. But of course, obviously, you had people packed in rather tightly. Uh, this gives you an idea. And essentially, what the ships would do was typically you would have a first class, a second class, perhaps a third class as well. And then you would have a deck of steerage. And steerage essentially meant that you did not have a private cabin, but rather you were in a dormitory style arrangement. Typically, the couples would be midships, single men at one end, single women at the other end. But it tended to be, uh, tended to be quite, quite crowded. You would have these sorts of communal dining rooms. 
And what's interesting about, uh, about the ships, in the very, very early days, people were expected to do their own cooking. But later, as time came along, uh, meals would actually be served. And typically, it'd be a stew or gruel, that sort of a thing. And what's, what's particularly interesting is some of these people were so very, very poor that even though today we don't think of steerage as being particularly desirable, in those days, some of these people might have actually arrived at the embarkation port so poor and literally so hungry that any sort of food served would have been far better and more uh, than the homelands that they were leaving. An interesting uh, dichotomy that we don't uh, perhaps appreciate so much today. This is a third class cabin, so you see this would have actually been fairly plush. Uh, this would have been plusher than a, than a steerage cabin because at least this is a private four berth cabin, but as you can see, uh, it doesn't look like our modern uh, cruise cabins do. And, uh, and of course, you could have a little bit of tightness uh, on some of the ships uh, when everybody was packed in. Here's a, a deck scene arriving uh, in New York Harbor with a tremendous amount of, uh, uh, of, of people packed on. So the, the concept of bring your huddled masses comes by rather honestly, I think. Well, again, we continue to have some speed. And here we are uh, going from the 19th century to the 20th century. Uh, and for simplicity, I've omitted a few of the ships along the way. But it gives you an idea of the progression. Uh, so we go from 22 knots in uh, 1895 all the way through to 1933. The Rex gets all the way to, to 28 knots per hour, uh, which is more than 30 miles per hour land speed. So we've got quite a bit of speed at this point. In a couple of moments, I'm going to talk about the Lusitania, the Mauritania, and the Aquitania, the great uh, trio of Cunard three stackers. Well, as I said earlier, in the original days uh, of the Cunard line, they needed four ships in order to have a, a weekly transatlantic crossing, because it would take about two weeks to get back and forth. The idea was to get from a four-ship format down to a three-ship format. And so all three of, of the major lines at the time, Cunard, White Star, and Happig, which was the German line, all planned a trio of ships. And uh, the new Mauritania and the Lusitania got the new turbine power plants. And so here's a lovely dreamy uh, picture of the Mauritania uh, at Cherbourg in France. Very, very nice, dreamy. This is the sort of thing you would have seen uh, for an advertisement, for example. And the Mauritania had an, had an interesting launch. Uh, many of the ships were launched out of the John Brown Yard in Glasgow uh, on, the, uh, on the Clyde, but there was the Swan Hunter Yard on the Tyne side uh, near Newcastle. And when the Mauritania was launched, it had to be done at just the right time in order to have a high enough tide on the river so that there'd be enough depth in the river to accommodate the hull. We'll see the launch of the Queen Mary uh, a little bit later in the program. But on uh, September 20th of 1906, they had to get that ship moving at precise time. And so the ship is already starting to launch just as the Duchess swings out and gets that bottle of champagne on the bow so that the ship was properly christened. Uh, time waits for no one, especially, especially tides. So here's a picture of the lovely Aquitania, one of the great classic, what we call Edwardian four stackers. Uh, she would become one of the blue ribbon holders and one of the most beloved ships of all time. Absolutely lovely ship. And here's the kind of interiors that the first class passengers would enjoy. One of the key things to remember about ships in those days was that they did not have the stabilizers that we enjoy today. So they did not have a way to prevent the roll uh, that, is, that is inevitable if you're on a ship. Today we have stabilizers, ballast tanks. So the idea was while someone was crossing the Atlantic, which could often be very cold, very windy, the idea was we wanted them, especially if they were in first class, to forget that they were on a ship. The idea was you wanted to feel like you were in a lovely grand hotel in London, for example, and so the decor was set up in that manner so that you would feel like uh, you were still on land. Here's the lovely first class dining room, nice, uh, nice vaulted ceiling there. 
Here is the uh, smoking room. Again, uh, it has the sense of being in a beautiful country house, perhaps, uh, or in a lovely hotel. And often in those days, you would have a men's smoking room. You would have a ladies' parlor uh, that the ladies and gentlemen would retire to after dinner. Occasionally, you would have a ballroom where an orchestra would play for dancing. Uh, verandas or winter gardens became very popular, and on uh, when the weather was a little bit more mild, it was nice to have wicker furniture and potted plants. Again, to give this country ambiance, almost to, to forget that you were at sea. Well, after World War II, uh, Germany had to rebuild many of its ships, and so two of, of the ships that competed for the Blue Ribbon, the Bremen and the Europa, and here they are uh, docked after World War II, after they were built, most of the German ships went over to the Allies as war reparations. And so the Germans had the opportunity then to rebuild new ships. The Europa was unique in that it was one of the first ships to have the bulbous bow, which, and you can't see it in this particular photo, but essentially modern ships, instead of coming to a knife point on the bow, actually have a little bit of material that sticks beyond the bow of the ship, and that's designed to help keep the ship more level in the water, helping to keep the propellers in the water back at the stern. Uh, this ship actually sailed all the way through till after World War II. The Rex was another lovely ship, and this was the only ship that, uh, that the Italian line ever won. Most of the time, the Blue Ribbon uh, was a back and forth between either the Germans or the British. We'll see how the U.S. came into play a little bit later. But this lovely ship, sadly, was lost during World War II, but was a, a truly magnificent ship. Sometimes you'll, you'll hear the Blue Ribbon, and they'll mention the Hales Trophy. Sometimes they'll say a ship was the Hales Trophy winner. The Hales Trophy was actually not created until 1935, when a member of Parliament uh, Sir Harold Keats Hales decided that there should be a proper trophy to award uh, to the holder of the Blue Ribbon, and so this uh, enormous Art Deco trophy was created. Now let's talk about two of the great ships of the 1930s that vied back and forth for the Blue Ribbon. The first was the lovely French ship, the Normandy. Uh, and it was one of the most beautiful ships ever made. We'll see some interiors in a few moments here. It would win the Blue Ribbon in both 1934 and in 1937. One of its unique features was that it was one of the first to have what we now call the turbo-electrical propulsion system, meaning that the engines, instead of being directly driving the propellers via a propeller shaft, the engines created electricity, and that electricity then drove a motor that turned the propeller. And that's the way almost all ships, uh, almost all modern ships today use that. Benefit of that is that you can move the engines uh, in a more advantageous way within the hull, gives you a little bit more design flexibility, uh, and also a little bit more speed. Very classic on this poster to see how uh, the ship looked coming in in the harbor. Again, very lovely Art Deco 30s style. And again, we have a cutaway, and I've got some, some additional pictures, but we see the, the engines here in the bottom. We see the lovely three-story dining room. This was one of the most beautiful dining rooms ever done. It's right here midships. We talked earlier about how often the dining rooms would be in the lower decks of the ship, and often midships for the first class so as to minimize the effect of the motion uh, within the ship. So let's see the interior of that uh, dining room. All of the glass and crystal on the walls is, was made by Lalique, and some of you perhaps collect Lalique to this day, and that was the manufacturer of this beautiful, beautiful interior. It was three decks high and started the tradition of French lines of having a staircase to enter into the dining room. And that was specifically done so that Madame could show off the dress as she entered into the dining room with undoubtedly a tuxedo gentleman on her arm. Here's again some of the lovely Art Deco work 
uh, that was featured on the Normandy because of its era. Absolutely beautiful, uh, beautiful relief work. Here we've got another shot of it. This is the sort of, of artwork that was in this lovely, lovely ship. Sadly, the Normandy, while she was being re retrofitted for World War II, caught fire in New York City. And as is often the case with ships, it wasn't so much the fire that got her, but they poured so much water into her to put out the fire that she capsized in the harbor and was a loss and was later broken up after the war. However, these beautiful doors were salvaged from the ship and are on a church, Our Lady of Lebanon, in Brooklyn, New York, and you can see them to this day. And they were from the dining room uh, of the Normandy. Well, now we get to the story of the birth of the Queen Mary. I've already said how originally Cunard had four ships to do a weekly express, then three ships with the Edwardian four stackers. And now the idea, as those Edwardian four stackers are getting a little bit old and ready to be replaced, the idea was to get to just two ships. That is to have one that would always be in England, one in New York, and they would crisscross uh, across the Atlantic. And so this was a dream of Cunard by the, uh, the mid-20s. And so the uh, keel for the Queen Mary was laid in the John Brown Yard in 1930, uh, but a problem occurred. A depression happened, and work on the ship absolutely stopped, and the hull lay rusting for nearly two years. And unfortunately, when it stopped, uh, it was right before Christmas. So everybody gets laid off, you know, Merry Christmas, not, not so terribly happy. Here is, and you notice how I've said, here is number 534 in the yard. At this point, the ship is not known as Queen Mary. She is known by her hull number, number 534. Well, I'll spare you all the, the intricate details of how it worked, but essentially the British government worked out a merger between Cunard Line and White Star Line, and work was restarted via a government loan on the Queen Mary. The first thing they had to do after nearly two years was to scrape off 130,000 tons of rust off the hull. That was the first thing that the workmen had to do at that point. So now comes the great apocryphal story of how did the Queen Mary get its name. And it's interesting because when you read the literature, uh, various books will absolutely give you as gospel one of three different versions. So I'm going to give you all the different stories and I'll let you make up your own mind. Traditionally, Cunard ships were, had a Romanish name. That is to say they ended with IA, Mauritania, Aquitania, etc. All the White Star ships ended with IC, Olympic, Britannic, Titanic, for example. And so here are at least a couple of the stories of how the, uh, how the Queen Mary got her name. There's, there's one story that says they were going to name it the Queen Mary right from the get-go, that that was what the Cunard directors had said, we're going we're to do this. There's another story that says they were going to name the ship the Queen Victoria, which would have made sense because that ended with the IA. And so the legendary story is that Sir Percy Bates goes to King George V and asks permission to name the ship. And what he's going to ask for is to name it after Queen Victoria, who was George V's grandmother. And so the legend has it that Sir Percy says, we'd like to name the ship after England's greatest queen. And His Majesty is reported to have replied, my wife will be delighted. <laughs> and of course, his wife was Queen Mary, Princess May of Tech, who had become Queen Mary. And so naturally, in that moment, what other name could it be but Queen Mary? Uh, there's even a third story that has Queen Mary herself sitting in the room and uttering the line, I would be delighted. So hard to know which is exactly true. The literature uh, conflicts with itself. Uh, I like to think of this story as perhaps the correct one. Interestingly enough, Queen Mary was a very traditional person. And the launching of the Queen Mary is the only time that she ever spoke in public. She was a very, very traditional Victorian woman, really, even though she was living uh, and did live up right up to uh, 1953. So here we are, 
September 26, 1934, on the Clyde Bank. Here are the king and queen uh, in the little raised podium, ready to launch the ship. And at this point, no one knows the name. It's an absolute secret what the name is. And Queen Mary says, I am happy to name this ship Queen Mary. May God bless her and all who sail in her. And at that point, of course, the crowd roars with this enormous cheer that it's going to be named the Queen Mary. And here is a, uh, a look-see at the launch of the ship. Now, you've all heard the expression, grease the skids. And you see this white material coming down here on both sides where the ship is sliding off. That literally is thousands of tons of beef tallow and whale oil. They literally did grease the skids so that the ship would slide off. And it took about a minute to slide the ship. This is one of the most difficult and treacherous uh, parts of an entire ship's life because the stress and strain as that ship comes down the ways and when most of the weight comes off of the, off of the skids, that's called hogging because you've got the stern end coming over. There's a tremendous amount of stress on a hull at that point. And so it, it can create quite a bit of, uh, of tension in, in the hull. Additionally, there's no engines on the ship at this point. So once that hull slides in the water, the tugs have got to grab it and maneuver it. Uh, and it sent quite a wave over the Clyde Bank, so spectators standing on the opposite shore were drenched when about a two-foot wave worked its way over. Uh, but nonetheless, it was, a, it was a source of great, great national pride. A special graving dock had to be built in Southampton. This actually is the, uh, the QE2 in the graving dock, but it gives you an idea of how big the Queen Mary had to be to fit uh, into, this special, into this special graving dock. And that, by the way, is the way ships are made now uh, in something very similar where they're built in a dock like that and they are floated out. They no longer slide them down the ways. That hasn't really happened since the, the 1960s, although the QE2 was, was slid down that same ways in the John Brown Yard. Well, one of the things about ships uh, is that every time you have a new generation, there are endless complaints sometimes about the fact that it doesn't look like the old ships. So earlier we saw the lovely Edwardian interiors. The Queen Mary, of course, being a product of the 30s, had more of the Art Deco style. And of course, some people, traditionalists, said, well, it doesn't look like the old ones. And other people, of course, liked the lovely, uh, the lovely Art Deco work. And fortunately, this ship still exists in Long Beach, and you can still see most of these features. Well, now you have the seesaw battle between the Normandy and the Queen Mary, and you can see how it's very, very incremental. Uh, really, just less than two knots separate the two ships, and they go back and forth between 1934 and 1938, when finally the Queen Mary sets the record at 31.69 knots crossing the Atlantic, and that record holds until we get to the SS United States, which we'll come to in a bit. And, of course, there were all kinds of great uh, posters and advertisements which would show how enormous the Queen Mary was. So, for example, here she is superimposed on Trafalgar Square. Just to give you an idea of the sense of proportion, the ship well over 1,000 feet long, and it is too wide to fit through the Panama Canal, for example. So when she sailed to Long Beach, they had to bring her around the Horn of, uh, of South America. Well... As we said earlier, Cunard needed a running mate, and that running mate was the ship that was to become the first Queen Elizabeth. And so here is that ship in the yard uh, in 1938. The ship was christened by the, the now Queen Elizabeth, who later became known as the Queen Mum, and the present queen was there as Princess Elizabeth on that day. But fate had a very different uh, end for the Queen Elizabeth because the Queen Elizabeth was being fitted out, but by 1940, uh, World War II had already begun, and so the British government became very concerned that the Queen Elizabeth was a sitting duck up in the, uh, in the Clyde in Scotland, and they were afraid that the Germans were going to come over and bomb her. And so as soon as she was seaworthy, she was ostensibly sent out to do sea trials. And so the crew was put onto the ship, and the idea was, well, we're just going to kind of bum around Scotland and Ireland and see if this thing will work. 
Well, the captain opened up the secret instructions once he put out to sea out of, out of Scotland, and it said, head for New York. And so, which is exactly what they did, and here is the ship arriving in New York a few days later. And some of the crew members who thought they were only going for four or five days didn't get back home to Scotland for four or five years. In some cases, did not get back until after the war ended, uh, if you can imagine that. But that was the sort of circumstance that occurred uh, during World War II. Notice that the ship is already painted battleship gray. Uh, the, the Queen Elizabeth was not painted in her proper commercial livery until 1946. Now here is the Queen Mary also in battleship gray. So instead of the black hull with the white superstructure, she's all gray. And by the way, you can always tell the two ships apart. The Queen Mary was a three-stacker. Queen Elizabeth was a two-stacker. Other than that, they looked fairly uh, similar. Now, just to give you an idea of what could happen out on the Atlantic, watch this next slide. This is also the Queen Mary. The ship will be turned. We'll be looking, here we're looking at her starboard side. We'll be looking at her port side. But watch the bow when it comes up on the left-hand side. Here she is going through a wave, the bow completely submerged in the water. That's the kind of waves that you would sometimes see uh, out on the Atlantic. If you can imagine all that bow material uh, completely su submerged. The key thing about these ships was that they were used as troop transport in World War II. Because both ships could make 30 knots, they were faster than the German U-boats, they were faster than any naval vessel, they actually traveled without any sort of an escort because nothing else could keep up with them, and they would use a zig and zag pattern. They never traveled the same way twice. Uh, and as a result, miraculously, they were never hit by, by enemy bombs. Uh, absolutely miraculous that these two ships uh, could make this. And we have in our audience, uh, by the way, because we're going to talk about uh, sailors coming back, we have Gil Small in our audience today. And Gil was one of the, shall we say, the lucky people who got to sail on a Cunard ship uh, he flew over on his tour of duty over to Europe, but on the way back home, sailed back uh, for nine very long, arduous days on a cramped troop ship on a, on a Cunard ship. Thank you for sharing that with us, Gil. Appreciate it. So you can see how packed the, uh, the, sa the sailors are. Actually, these are, these are our GIs on the ship, because normally the ships were made for maybe 2,500 people. Some of these sailings, would have as many as 15,000 men packed onto a ship designed to only hold 2,600. Uh, and so what they would do in a cabin that would maybe normally hold two people, you would have berths three stacked, for example. And they would use what's called rotation sleeping. So man number A gets into a bunk, sleeps for eight hours, gets out, B gets in, sleeps eight hours, gets out, C gets in, sleeps eight hours, and then back to A all over again. So that the, the, the beds were never cool because you always were rotating. Uh, the, the next man would come in. And they only fed the guys twice a day because, again, the kitchens are running 24 hours a day. If you can imagine, uh, even to prepare for 15,000 people, two meals is 30,000 uh, 30, meals, if you think about it. Uh, so quite an, an amazing accomplishment. Very, very tight quarters. There aren't a lot of photos because obviously for security reasons that wouldn't have been appropriate. This is an interesting picture. This was taken in Long Beach. The, the woman standing here, uh, Miss Sullivan, this is her father over her, uh, over her left shoulder, Sergeant Sullivan, and you can see him packed in with all his buddies on the ship. And so here she is uh, taking a picture in front of her father many, many years, uh, many, many years later, uh, remembering his service to the U.S. Well, Sir Winston Churchill credited the ships with shortening the war because you could get so many people over uh, in, in such a very, very quick time. And one key point, the ships were absolutely dry because you couldn't have people getting a little bit inebriated. The ships were dry except for when Churchill himself would cross, they were dry except for Churchill's stateroom. There was always a little bit of brandy. And so here we are. This is August 31st, 1945. This is the Queen Elizabeth coming home. And you can see a couple of the guys hanging out 
uh, of the uh, portholes. I don't recommend that passengers uh, hang out of their portholes on ships, but I think in the exuberance of VE Day and VJ Day, perhaps that's, uh, that's excusable. So after World War II ends, then the ships can in fact be converted back uh, to the express service, the, the weekly service in fact, that, uh, that had been the dream. And often the two ships would meet at sea. We have the, the Queen Mary in the foreground, the three stacker, Queen Elizabeth, the two stacker in the background. And the captains, the respective captains, would get the ships as close as safety would allow, maybe about a mile apart as they would cross in the Atlantic. And it was a big deal. And of course, the passengers would all line up. And it happened very, very quickly because the ships are traveling perhaps at about 30 knots, which is close to 35 miles an hour. So if you imagine in your car, if you're going 35 miles an hour and you pass a car going the opposite way at 35, that happens rather quickly. And so uh, it was a very quick moment. The ships would appear, pass, and then each disappear off into the Atlantic. And this was commemorated in the dining room of the Queen Mary. And I know it's a bit tough to see because of the colors. The black over here on the right, that's England. Here's New York on our left. And you can see these little lines. And there were two of them. And see right here where the dot is, that would be the ship. And so they would have both ships uh, wherever the other one would be on the track. And so each night as you came into the dining room, you could see where your ship, the Queen Mary, was. And you could see where the Elizabeth was in relationship uh, to, uh, to your ship. So you could sort of keep track of it as you went through the voyage. That's before you had uh, GPS systems, I suppose. Well, the United States, from a military and strategic standpoint, recognized after World War II that the U.S. needed to have a ship that could also work as a troop ship. From a military standpoint, even though they liked having the Cunard ships, the problem was you, you didn't want to have, uh, you, you wanted to have the ability to have your own troop ship with a ship that you owned. And so the SS United States was developed. Uh, as what would become the fastest ship uh, at 35.59 knots uh, when it did its initial sailing. And no passenger ship since has ever challenged uh, for the Blue Ribbon. Well, the story of the SS United States, of course, begins with none other than the First Lady, Frances Cleveland. And you might say, well, how is that possible? Frances Cleveland was the wife of President Grover Cleveland, and in 1894, she launched the St. Louis. And in that audience was an eight-year-old boy, William Francis Gibbs. And right then and there, as a young child, Mr. Gibbs decided to devote his life to ships. And sometimes you know how a young child will know at a very early age that they want to be uh, a, a particular occupation and Mr. Gibbs was no exception to that. And so here he is on the left. He would go on to become quite a naval architect, did quite a bit of military uh, ships. He was part of a, uh, of, a, of a major engineering firm. What's interesting is that even as far back as 1919, he had uh, proposed the idea of a, of a thousand foot ocean liner capable of doing 30 knots. And so after World War II, the U.S. government says, we need to have something that's comparable to the Cunards. And so here is the SS United States in the yard at, New, at uh, Bethlehem Steelworks in 1952. Here she is. The ship still exists, by the way. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. And here's one of these great cutaways, again, showing the, the engine rooms, showing the two stacks, showing where all of the cabins are. Uh, the, these are classic sorts of, of posters that were designed for the ships. And as we said, she did in fact uh, achieve the Blue Ribbon on her first crossing at 35.59 knots, which is the equivalent of about 41 miles an hour land speed. Now, the only thing about that kind of speed is that it almost tore up the engines to go that fast. It's sort of like your automobiles. You know, they maybe can go 100 miles an hour or 110, but if you, if you really, really did drive it that fast, you would, you would wear out the engines. So she seldom went that fast in the, in the future, but she had established herself as the fastest ship. Well, of course, because she was so fast, 
Many, many celebrities, many, many famous people sailed on her. There's tons of these sort of photos, so I've, I've shortened it uh, a little bit. But just to give you an idea, here's Judy Garland in 1956 enjoying, enjoying dinner aboard. Uh, here's Salvador Dali, the artist on the right, uh, seated. Here, this is a great photo here, uh, Alfred Hitchcock and Bob Hope. And, and I've always enjoyed that because you seldom think of Alfred Hitchcock ever smiling, uh, but here he is, here he is smiling. And you can see how very elegant it is, tuxedos, of course. This is kind of a cute uh, photo. This is Ozzie and Harriet Nelson, and of course the little boy in the white dinner jacket is Rick Nelson, who would grow up to be a, a famous star in his own right. Great, uh, great family photo there. But perhaps the most famous people that ever sailed the SS United States were the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. And one of the reasons why the Duke liked the ship, he often had, of course, sailed on the Queen Mary or the Queen Elizabeth, but one of the benefits to him uh, of sailing on the American ship was that it was a backhanded way uh, of getting back at his, uh, at his British relatives because there was always haggles over money and that sort of thing. And the fact that the Duke would sail on the SS United States, the ship would sell out instantly because people wanted to perhaps catch a glimpse uh, of the most famous uh, romantic couple, at least of the mid-20th century, certainly. And so here they are at embarkation. Here's the duck suite, which is the suite that they stayed in. Now, one of the things about the SS United States was that because she was designed to be turned very quickly to a troop ship, she was not as plush in some respects as what people had expected a ship might be. And often you did have a certain amount of exposed steel, quite a bit of formica, and in fact the only two things on the ship that were made out of wood were the chef's butcher block in the galley and the pianos. And the only reason that the pianos were made out of wood was because Theodore Steinway had flat refused Mr. Gibbs making the piano out of aluminum uh, because the concern about fire safety. Uh, but but uh, Mr. Steinway held his ground and the pianos were made out of wood. So here's the duck suite as it normally would appear before the Duke and Duchess got there. Well, the Duke and Duchess <clears throat> essentially lived a nomadic life, if you will. So they would spend part of their time in the United States, in the Waldorf Astoria, and then they would come back over to France uh, perhaps once a year. And so anytime they traveled, it was a major, major expedition. So they would, uh, they would sail across with up to 150 pieces of luggage. The luggage would be inventoried at least twice during the voyage, and the Duchess would have the suite redecorated for the voyage. So leopard skin prints would be put in, special sheets and towels, Everything absolutely perfect for the Duchess. And finally, she always took her meals in their suite rather than in the captain's table because ship's captains were inclined to pinch. At least that was her, uh, that, that, that was her uh, explanation. Great shot here of the Duke and Duchess with a cake. And again, you notice over, this is the duck suite, the top suite, and you notice how you do see the porthole, you see some of the steel. So even though you have a, a very fast ship, uh, it was in essence almost a naval vessel in a way designed to be very quickly turned into a troop ship. So it lived kind of uh, both lives. Well, in addition to the SS United States, a couple of great ships uh, that came about from the US were the Independence and the Constitution, two sister ships built in the early 1950s. Neither of these ever competed for the Blue Ribbon, but one of them did serve a, a very special function we'll see in a moment. Again, just a couple of, of views of life aboard a ship in the 1950s. Again, gents in the nice white dinner jackets, women in the lovely, in the lovely ball gowns, a very elegant way to go, certainly. Already, and, and I know you can't read all the text in this uh, advertisement, uh, but the headline there says, uh, why just get there when you can cruise there? Already by the 50s, the ocean liners were having to compete with the jet plane and the development of, of planes as they came along. And so the idea was, well, why be cramped in a little plane when you can 
do like these people, where you're sitting out on the Lido deck by the pool, the steward is bringing a, uh, a nice cool drink, a much more pleasant way to travel, and I still think so. Well, the most famous passenger on the Constitution was none other than Grace Kelly, and I had the good fortune uh, on one of my ships to meet a woman whose brother was the chief purser on the Constitution during this voyage in 1956. And uh, this is kind of an interesting sequence. This is Grace Kelly sailing over to Monaco to marry Prince Rainier. And watch her hats in these next three uh, slides. Here she is, April 4th, 1956, very New York pillbox hat. Lovely photo of her at sea uh, looking out across the ocean. This is April of 1956, very casual. And finally, arriving in Monaco on April 12th, 1956. Very haute couture, isn't she? With the, with the lovely European hat and sunglasses. And of course, uh, her fairy tale marriage to Prince Rainier of Monaco. This is her wedding day, a very, very lovely photo. And for those of you who have not been to Monaco, uh, do get a chance to look at the Royal Palace and the Cathedral. It's, it's fantastic. Well, the French were not about to let the British and the Americans have the absolute last word. And so Charles de Gaulle, after World War II, wanted to have a ship that would compete from a national prestige-wise uh, with the Americans and the British. And so here is the SS France at Chantours d'Atlantique in the Loire Valley in France. Uh, and I did get a chance to sail on this ship in 1992 later on as the Norway. Absolutely beautiful ship. And I've included the, the French newspaper bit uh, for it. And at the top it says, le plus grand packet boat du monde. That means the largest passenger ship in the world. Because she was over a thousand feet long. I think about a, uh, a thousand and thirty-five feet long. So she was the longest ship. She never would compete from a speed standpoint uh, with the SS United States. This is the launch in 1960 by Madame de Gaulle, and the maiden voyage was in 1962. And here she is arriving in New York with the flotilla and the fireboats coming in. Very, very nice. And of course, again, these lovely stylized uh, advertisements for the French line. Very, very elegant. And here is the beautiful Chambord restaurant, and I've included this uh, photograph for a couple of reasons. One, as with all French lines, you see how they had kept the tradition of the staircase so that Madame could still make the grand entrance into the room so that everyone could see the dress. You had this lovely dome that simulated uh, essentially being uh, a nighttime uh, effect. And this restaurant was considered, when you ordered off menu, one food critic said it was the best French restaurant in the world. Uh, that is to say, the French government spent an enormous amount of money from a subsidy standpoint. Best champagne, best caviar, pretty much flowed like, uh, flowed like water. And over on the walls were these beautiful murals, and here they come up on the ones on the top. These lovely murals, very stylized figures, made from lovely woods from various parts of, of French colonial Africa. And fortunately, even though the ship sadly uh, is, as we say, no longer with us. It's been scrapped. Uh, my understanding is these murals were pulled out of the ship before she was sent to the breakers. So indeed, it was an absolutely lovely, lovely ship. And as I said, I had a chance to sail on her. Uh, she had a second life after having been retired in 1974 from the fuel crisis. I got a chance to sail on her in 1992 when she became the Norway. Uh, and so she had a 23-year career in the Caribbean. Well, here we have Luxury Liner Row in 1957. Uh, we've got the Independence. We've got the SS United States. And I believe we've got the, the Queen Elizabeth here. So this was how it might have looked in New York Harbor in 1957. 57 is a seminal year because that was the year, that was the crossover year, if you will, where more passengers began going to Europe by plane rather than by ship. By 1958, jet planes arrived. And so after that, very, very quickly, the need to have a ship to get across the Atlantic really, really diminishes. So that by the mid-60s, the ships are sailing uh, fairly empty. And so as, we've, as we will see in our, in our next program, 
uh, tomorrow, ships then changed from essentially crossing to cruising, and that's a whole other story. So here is the Queen Mary sailing out of New York Harbor for the last time in 1967, uh, and the end came pretty quickly for all the ships. This is what happened to these, these ships. The Queen Mary, of course, retired uh, to Long Beach. Thankfully, she's still upright. Sadly, the Queen Elizabeth retired out in 68, was going to be retrofitted in Hong Kong, uh, and burned out during a, during a retrofit. The SS United States still does exist. As of this date, she is sitting on Columbus Avenue in Philadelphia, and I've driven by it. You can stand where you're maybe not more than 30 feet from the bow. She sadly is quite rusty. Whether she can ever be uh, redone the way the Queen Mary is, hard to say. She's actually been towed to Turkey and back to have her asbestos pulled out. Uh, and then sadly, the uh, the SS France uh, was scrapped out uh, the end of 2008-2009. And so that is the end of the story of the crossings. But cruising still is a huge part of travel today. There's a continued emphasis on large ships, a lot more options, a lot more ports of departure with the idea that people don't have to fly as much to get on their ships. And I still think uh, cruising is the best way there is to travel. And so we'll finish up, as I always do, with one last look at the beautiful Grace Kelly sailing across the Atlantic. And I think she represents for us, all of us, who either have sailed across a ship in search of a new life, the way the immigrants did, or people like you and I that sail on the great ships of the oceans of the world in search of new adventure. I wish all of you many, many great days and travels on the great ships of the seven seas. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed our presentation on the great ships of the seven seas. And I wish for all of you many, many great adventures as you too sail across the oceans of the world. Thank you and bon voyage.